That's the sound of decades of testing. And don't worry, there's no one inside the rockets. These rocket launch tests were made by the U.S. space program some six decades ago. In the testing stage, before failure is not an option, it actually is. These failures were catastrophic, but not a catastrophe. They helped identify fixes that would help ensure astronaut safety come mission time. Failure in testing is often called a failure of imagination. Case in point, Apollo 13. Apollo 13 is presently 171,246 nautical miles away from Earth. Continuing to monitor, this is Apollo Control, Houston. In April 1970, the crew of Apollo 13 were poised to be the next humans to walk on the moon. 56-ish hours into their mission, a service module explosion changed everything. Punctuated by a now iconic line, widely misquoted. Houston, we've had a problem. No guff. Damaged insulation on wires within an oxygen tank. Damage caused long before liftoff. Caused an explosion that had blown away the side of the service module. Causing oxygen to leak out into space. What was supposed to be NASA's third landing on the moon turned into a rescue mission. NASA ground crew had to immediately start brainstorming ways to get the astronauts back to Earth. With the command module dying, the crew moved into the lunar module, Aquarius. Three crew huddled in a craft designed to sustain two. Non-critical systems were shut down to preserve power. Water rations were limited to allow for the cooling of Aquarius's overtaxed hardware. Were they safe now? Of course not. The Aquarius CO2 scrubbers, designed to filter out carbon dioxide for two men, couldn't keep up with the demands of three. This time, without the benefit of testing, NASA engineers had to get really creative. With what else but duct tape. The engineers in Mission Control used a plastic bag, cardstock, a spacesuit hose, and duct tape to create a filter system that saved the astronauts' lives. Little wonder that duct tape was listed in NASA's official stowage lists in every Apollo mission from 11 to 17. But this wasn't the only close call of the Apollo era. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Apollo 11 was only four minutes into its historic descent to the moon's crater-pocked surface when a fuel light blinked on. The spacecraft's commander, Neil Armstrong, knew the engine's tank was nearly dry. Mission Control back in Houston told them they only had 60 seconds to land on the moon. Armstrong could see the surface of the moon through his small window in the spacecraft. They had to keep going, just a little bit longer. Dust swirled around the spacecraft as it got closer to the moon's surface until, finally, phew! Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Apollo 11 had only 15 seconds of fuel to spare. Every aspect of the Apollo 11 moon landing was tested, and tested again to make sure everything would work. That's what happens with every mission to space. But Apollo 11 was different. When you're bound for the moon for the very first time, it's mighty hard to know what you don't know. This is the story of testing for spaceflight. A story that's tested the nerves of most everyone on this planet. Uh, testing. One... Two, three. Testing one, two, three. Why testing matters. This is a test. An original podcast from NI. This is only a test. Three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past. Hi, I'm Derek Burrows. You've got to think there were thousands of, gee, we're sure glad we tested this, moments in space engineering. And this was definitely one of them. In December 1967, engineers were testing Grumman's LM5, the lunar module that would take Armstrong and Aldrin to the moon less than two years later. During its initial pressurization test, one of the two triangular windows in front of the vehicle shattered. 
in the complex, highly technical parlance of NASA, this was classified as not good. Among the fixes was a protective cover developed for the windows that showed a mark if anyone so much as touched them. And a new testing procedure was put into place to screen the windows. The last thing on a checklist before a launch? Tear off those protective covers. This test proved invaluable. Eight windows failed the test over the course of the Apollo program, but not one of them during a mission. There are plenty of instances, and I'll get to some of them, when disasters did occur. From NASA's early days to the modern era, space exploration has led to some of the most spectacular and public test failures. It's this sort of failure during testing that helps prevent failure during a mission. To learn more about the role testing plays in NASA's successes and failures, I drove to the Johnson Space Center in Houston. There, I met up with Amy Shira Title. She's an author and a spaceflight historian. We are currently in NASA headquarters, the exciting central location where all things space converge in the country. I was expecting to be lined by a spacecraft or something, but this is looking pretty ordinary. A lobby always has like a cool space display, so like an astronaut or something. But other than that, it's just a pretty chill office building. I think my favorite thing in NASA headquarters is the archives in the basement because I am an, an historian and I do like it down there. And it's just this like very quiet, kind of cold basement office with no windows. You're like, the history of the U.S. space program lives in this windowless room. <laughs> Amy's an expert on the Cold War because space exploration is, after all, a byproduct of the war. On October 4th, 1957, the Soviets launched the first artificial satellite into the Earth's orbit. The beep, beep, beep of Sputnik was heard around the world. Sputnik was about the size of a microwave oven, but by God, it struck fear and awe into the hearts of Americans. This was during the time when schools across the U.S., were teaching kids to hide under their desks to save themselves from the atomic bomb. So, objects created by the Soviet Union floating around in space was cause for alarm. America's response to Sputnik? Eisenhower chose the Navy's Vanguard satellite because it was all American, not built by former Nazis like the Redstone satellite that was developed, being developed under the Army Ballistic Missile Association. It was meant to be a test. It was the TV-3 test. But Eisenhower announced that it was going to be the launch. So all of a sudden it's like, oh, so now the world is watching. This is our response to Sputnik live on television. The thing lifts four inches off the launch pad and then collapses. And everyone's like, good job, America. It's like, this thing was not ready to fly. This rocket was having issues. I mean, the Redstone got it within two months because that rocket was vastly better and the team behind it was better in terms of engineers. But, oh my God, had they just announced it was a test and not publicized it, it would have been a very different story. But instead, they went forward and had to say like, yep, we're launching a satellite today. We don't know how to do this. (laughs) You know, going in, your narrative going in can shape expectations in a very good way. (laughs) Yeah. only too clearly. Fire followed the explosion. The launching of an American moon had still to be accomplished. A big setback indeed, but probably more so in the realm of prestige and propaganda than in any other way. In contrast to the U.S., the Soviets made their space program a closely guarded state secret. But the entire world saw America's space hopes and dreams literally go up in flames. The press dubbed the vanguard Flopnik and Kaputnik. The space race was on. NASA was founded a year after Sputnik launched, with the intent of gaining a global edge in space. NASA's goal? Put a man in orbit around the Earth. So they launched Project Mercury, the first human spaceflight program in the U.S. In 1959, seven former military pilots were chosen to be the first Americans in space. The astronauts, all used to testing experimental aircrafts and rockets, were dubbed the Mercury 7. 
Even before they flew in space, they became household names and celebrated heroes. When the first group was selected, from the moment they were chosen as potential astronaut candidates, everything was a test. Every conversation was a look into their personality. You know, are you daring without being foolhardy? Do you want to do this because you have a death wish or because you want to push your career forward? And then, you know, that's not counting the things like, are you physically fit? And, you know, the, the medical testing was extremely extensive if you've ever seen the right stuff. How am I doing? I think you're going to make it, man. I think you're going to be an astronaut. <clears throat> it's that very in-depth probing every area of the human body as deep as you can possibly probe it, as John Glenn famously joked at the press conference in 1959. Uh, you answer which one would be hardest for you. <laughs> because in the 50s, late 50s, early 60s, they didn't know what was going to happen to a human in space. If your eyes would distort and you'd be blind, if you'd be able to swallow food, you know, every single thing was a question that no one knew the answer to. And as we kind of continue to push into longer duration missions, we start looking forward, you know, we're still a ways off, but forward to long duration missions outside Earth orbit to Mars, you still need that intense physicality and you need certain preparations. So there are still astronauts who come from fighter pilot schools. And that was originally because who knows how to respond very quickly to emergencies in the air and make snap decisions and who can also then communicate that to the engineers on the ground, test pilots. That's the closest equivalent job. That need has changed, but you still kind of need someone in that vein. So you still have pilot astronauts. There is extensive testing done on every facet of a person to make sure that they are the best person for the mission. As if the challenge of physics and engineering weren't enough, another barrier to human spaceflight was human prejudice. As of March 2021, of the more than 500 people who've made the trip to space, just 65 of them are women. During the earliest days of NASA, highly skilled female pilots dreamed of being the first American woman in space. Jackie Cochran was the first woman to break the sound barrier. At the time of her death in 1980, she held more propeller and jet flying records than anyone, man or woman. Jerry Cobb, record-holding pilot, she too was chosen as a member of the First Lady Astronaut Trainees, or FLATS, a group later dubbed the Mercury 13. This was a group of women NASA selected for the same rigorous astronaut training as John Glenn and the other members of the Mercury 7. There were physical exams, eye tests, freezing cold water was squirted into their ears to induce vertigo, they were put into sensory deprivation tanks and other confined spaces. They were poised to take on all of the testing endured by the first male astronauts, the Mercury 7. And yet, they would never travel in space. In September 1961, NASA canceled the program just days before their training. T minus 25 seconds and counting. The sequencer on board now controlling the final seconds. Two decades would pass before Sally Ride became the first American woman to fly in space. And liftoff, liftoff of STS-7 and America's first woman astronaut. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. NASA has stated that the next footprints on the moon will be made by women. And so few women have gone to space so far. So what are your thoughts on NASA's push for inclusion in space and the progress that we've made thus far? I think the push for inclusion is a great one, not just inclusion of women, but inclusion of everybody who's not the sort of, you know, quote unquote, typical astronaut that we see kind of carried over from the Apollo era, which is the middle-aged white Protestant male with a wife and two children, because they were all very much an archetype. This archetype influenced and inspired the design of NASA spacesuits, which were only worn by men until 1983. NASA actually canceled plans for the first ever all-women spacewalk in 2019. The problem? Two astronauts, but only one suit that fit. So, one of the women was replaced by a man who could wear a larger suit. After 30 years of triumph and tragedy, and very possibly millions of hours of testing, 
NASA's space shuttle program ended in 2011, when Atlantis and its four-member crew touched down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And the handoff to Atlantis's onboard computers. Enter the private sector. SpaceX, Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin, with talk of exploration, enterprise, and even space tourism. Like NASA during the Cold War, companies like SpaceX aren't afraid to be transparent about their failures. Neither is Firefly, another private space firm working with NASA. They're located in a nondescript industrial park in the small town of Briggs, Texas, where engineers regularly blast fire across the pasture. Megan Roth, Firefly's manager of test operations and engineering, showed me around the company's 200-acre testing and manufacturing site, albeit virtually. We're uh, standing adjacent to TS-1. TS-1 is our horizontal engine test stand, and we are, at least by my calculations, in the clear zone. So if something was to go awry, we should, by math, be safe. If you're looking at the stand, you'll see the engines pointing horizontally, and the nozzle is about parallel with us. In front of that is what we like to call Lake Firefly, but it's basically the ditch we've dug from all of our engine testing, which is pretty exciting. The other kind of key features to this stand is our uh, fuel storage, which allows us to press fuel to supply it to the engine. Lock storage, as well as the very large tank, is FireX. So that's water just in the event that there is an anomaly. If we're patient, we might see an engine fire here in just a few moments. I've got to say, I'm glad that you set us up this far away, because I didn't realize all of these systems were for causing or preventing fire. You know, it's it's a critical part of, of rockets is, you know, both making the fire in the right direction as well as putting it out when it goes in the wrong one. How common are fires on this particular rig we've got here? I mean, when they're planned multiple times a day, unplanned, we try to keep those to a minimum. It's not uncommon for problems to occur when testing rocket engines, but I trust Megan to keep me out of harm's way. Why does testing matter? Testing matters because we get 168 seconds of glory for the first stage. The thing about rockets is you can have a lot of failures along the way, you can have a lot of testing along the way, but you get one chance to make it perfect. Particularly if it's manned flight, like we're just talking about, you think about all the things they did with the Mercury vehicles and how terrifying that must have been, and like the tragedy of Apollo 1. You can't mess up. The analogy that I like to use to kind of explain how integral we are to success is like if you have a NASCAR vehicle and you have a driver and they're driving it, that car eventually has to come in for a pit stop where you like refuel it and you change the tires and you assess how things are going and the performance and you make sure that you will be successful in that race. And very much the test team is both the driver as well as that pit crew. And so we are integral to the success of something, even if we weren't the people that designed it. We are you know, responsible for optimizing, for actually utilizing the products, and for ensuring that they function as designed. Because very often you get a design that needs a bit of a refinement. And so the people that really become experts on how these things work are the test team, because we use them day in and day out. There are some exciting things happening along the final frontier. And Firefly is building on the foundation from NASA's glory days, lowering the cost and increasing access to space. What do you see as coming next in space travel? I think there's two branches, and I think one of the big things that we're going to see in space is the bifurcation of investment. And so one part being the kind of quintessential scientific approach where we're just going to learn because learning is there. It's the whole, why do you climb Mount Everest? Because it's there type of deal. And then I think at the same time, it's going to be opening up space to people that couldn't previously access it, be it through personal adventure and exploration or kind of what Firefly is doing, where we do have missions where you can ride share. And it's a lot lower cost than if you were trying to go for a SpaceX mission. So now things like students or small companies or just interested party can now launch satellites when previously that never would have been something that was available to them. So I think you're going to start to see that that split between the old school and new school, if you will. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. Go NASA. Go SpaceX. Godspeed. Bob and Doug. NASA's history is riddled with failure. Some tragic, but many others helpful. These are the kind revealed by testing, which can lead to better safety. 
through these tests comes innovation. NASA has lofty goals, and they've had them from the very beginning. They want to expand our knowledge of space, lead the world in technical innovation, and make scientific advancements. NASA has achieved many of these goals, and that can be attributed, at least in part, to rigorous testing. Testing led to the Apollo missions. And with each mission, NASA tested more. Various aspects of the operation understood better and better, decreasing chances of failure. The current generation of space explorers have learned a thing or two about the importance of testing from NASA. Today, we're engaged in a whole new kind of space race. NASA's planning to land the first woman and the next man on the moon in 2024 as part of its current program of crewed lunar exploration. Aptly enough, they've named the New Moon program after Artemis, the sister of Apollo in Greek mythology. And if you were wondering about those spacesuits, and whether or not NASA will have one that fits for all of its crew members, the agency's working on it. They presented a prototype back in 2019 made for all genders. The suits also have more room for the astronauts to move around more freely when they land on the moon. In the past 50 years, technology has improved. NASA has learned valuable lessons from the Apollo missions that will help ensure the safety of the future Artemis crew. Humanity's reach extends still farther into the heavens, one test at a time. I'm Derek Burrows. Testing 123 is an original podcast from NI. To find out more, visit our webpage at ni.com perspectives.